<laughs> is there any kind of a pointer? Oh. Right there. Oh, this. Okay, good. All right, well, let's see if I can... Okay, so we're going along the same line as uh, the previous speaker in attempting to get simplicity, but we're also trying to use an engineering principle of practicality. And uh, so one of the things we're starting with, I, I'll tease you, but I really do think what, you, <laughs> what you're doing is extremely important. And uh, um, one of the suggestions people have made is, well, let's get rid of one codon. Uh, you've at least accomplished that, and that's a, a big job in E. coli. Anyway, I, 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 uh, I want to start right out and and point out the collaborators who've worked on this. There's a group in Saged, Hungary, Georgi Poshvai and his student, Fair Tamash. Uh, Gunter Kyle is from a uh, laboratory of animal virology in Germany, which I will uh, get to some very interesting experiments that he happened on that I'm going to speak. And then Sarah Harkham is a fermentation specialist at uh, Clemson University who's been working with us. And then my group uh, in Madison uh, includes all of these people who work for a new company we just formed called Scarum Genomics. Uh, this technology was developed in my lab at the university and it's sort of being technology transferred by uh, these people joining the company. Anyway, another thing my university calls for is that I have to tell you that I have a financial interest in three companies in every talk. Uh, and now we get to the, to the, uh, to the first slide. Uh, E. coli, uh, we sequenced with great effort in the very early days, and uh, the uh, genome has just been updated, and I wanted to let you all know that if you go to this website, you'll be able to get a copy of the sequence that has had uh, 375 mistakes corrected. I'm kind of impressed. These, this was uh, Dr. Horiuchi in Japan who s finished totally sequencing the uh, W3110 strain and uh, found some differences and then went back and compared it with the MG1655 strain that we had sequenced and he was right on 374 out of 375 uh, differences. But I'm kind of proud of the fact that with the technology that was available at that time, we got to the level of one mistake every 10,000 bases. Anyway, the corrected version is up. Uh, there's improvement in simplification. There are now fewer open reading frames than there were. Uh, the reannotation has merged up some fragments of open reading frames. And uh, there's still 18 percent of this genome has genes that are of essentially unknown function. Many of them have matches to other genes of unknown function in other organisms, but uh, when we started it was 37 percent of unknown function, but there's still an awful lot to learn about E. coli. So, uh, one of the things I thought I would do is uh, get to the, a little bit about what we know about the functions of the E. coli genes. You can classify the ones that are known, and it has basically all the things needed to make a robust life form that can grow on mineral salts medium. And, and it is also a metabolically very general in that it has two whole ways of doing things, anaerobic or aerobic. So it can switch back and forth. Uh, if it spends most of its time in the guts of animals, which I'm not sure if that's true, uh, what it does is lives right on the outer uh, surface of the, well, the inner surface, uh, depending on your point of view, on the surface of the gut wall. And uh, I tend to have an inside view uh, for some reason, <laughs> speaking of philosophy. Uh, <coughs> Sorry. Uh, anyway, the uh, this is serious business. Uh, <laughs> uh, on that inner surface, there's oxygen that is coming in from the capillaries, and the uh, anaerobic bacteria that are in the gut are sh either shielded uh, by having that oxygen scavenged out, or E. coli is using this as a opportunistic uh, way of uh, of uh, gaining an energy advantage over over the anaerobe, but actually the regulation is very fascinating right at that margin where it really grows, where both functions can happen at once. And, and the, um, the cell has stuff that even shields some of these uh, enzymes that are damaged by oxygen, uh, things that look like cytochromes that go around them. 
so that it can do this uh, process of taking advantage of the TCA cycle at the same time as uh, doing anaerobic fermentation. Another uh, thing that E. coli has, and I wouldn't be surprised if, uh, if the other organism, uh, um, mycoplasma, has, is chaperones. There's a huge investment made in folding proteins correctly, or at least folding them, and it's not clear whether you could ever get rid of all of the chaperones. And so there's, a, there's just a contrast. I'm not sure whether it's between the organisms or just between the perception, but there's a huge amount of integration of functions that uh, there's a lot of genes that have two or three modules uh, of a chemical reaction, possibly so that the substrates don't have to diffuse very far. And I think it'd be very hard to believe that we could understand that except by experiment. And so one of the things I like about this project, which is reducing the genome, is exactly the point that was made before, that we learn a lot of biology as we go along. So I think uh, with a list like this, we decided to pick some things that we really could delete uh, because they really looked unimportant and then work our way down. Uh, one thing that was really interesting to me, and uh, this is a little bit hard slide to explain because it's kind of a statistical nightmare, but basically this is the percentage of the genes for that function that are highly expressed. And it turns out that the genes that are poorly expressed in lab cultures, at least, are the ones we don't know anything about. Duh. <laughs> a lot depends on what you actually look at. And just starting these anaerobic experiments, we got this huge parcel of very highly expressed genes that have a Y in the name, which means they're unknown. So I think it's important to go for a lot of different conditions. And in order to standardize, a standardizable medium is really important. Uh, something like LB gives you a different gene expression pattern every time because every batch of LB has got a different mixture of God knows what. So I think uh, it's not just so that you can make it convenient, but also it's very hard to do the research on gene expression unless you have a very defined way to culture the organism. Uh, uh, Anyway, in the course of the research on now sequencing four strains of E. coli, uh, we've come up with the realization that the, there's an ancestral backbone sequence in the genome we call a core that is common basically to all the strains. And you can see it in uh, some rather distant enterobacteria, ACI, fairly, uh, fairly uh, re re rearranged, but the genes are there. Uh, the codon usage tends toward a uh, evolutionarily defined uh, consistency in the part of the genome that evolved by descent. Uh, that's what the core genome looks like. And what it includes are the essential housekeeping genes, pathways, characteristics of the genus, DNA replication, all the stuff that is uh, really kind of going to contribute to a generic uh, bacteria would probably be in the core genome. And then these islands, which are relatively recently introduced, acquired through horizontal gene transfer, uh, weird codon use usages reflecting different origins, and then pathogenic strains contain vir virulence and pathogenicity genes, uh, combinations uh, are probably needed to get a pathogen. Uh, the sorts of estimates are is that you need to put together about 50 things at random in order to get a pathogen, just judging from the numbers of factors that people begin to study when they actually start taking apart the pathogenicity, uh, of the pathogen function. Uh, I believe that what these islands really do is confer uh, the ability to grow in a niche. The niche may be uh, living off of some pathogenic process, but also beta-galactosidase and lac operon is, a, is on an island. And uh, the only thing I can think of is that if the genome could get as big as you wanted to, you could probably have every niche, but that isn't the way it works. Whether there's a lack of autonomy and having a huge chromosome uh, or whatever it is, this thing keeps changing to, to be able to grow in different niches. 
Now I'm going backwards there. Uh, then there is a phenomenon which I'm not going to talk about where you have specific hypervariable regions that are uh, intended to foil the immune system and those of course are not conserved in the same sense. Now when we sequenced O157H7 and we found these intergressed regions or islands, uh, it was then pretty interesting to see that E. coli K12, the lab strain, also had islands. Those are the red things. And so uh, we came up with this Venn diagram in which the uh, core would be this blue stuff and then there'd be lineage specific segments. And the lineage specific segments in 0157 is really quite huge, 1.2 million base pairs, 20% uh, of the genome. It's a little bit less for K12. Then we did the third genome, which was a uropathogenic strain. And that gives you a three-way Venn diagram. Uh, and once you get three of them, you can start seeing that the core begins to uh, be defined now as uh, that which is in common between three. No question there's a lot of things that occur in only one genome. Not too much that occurs in just two. So it really looks like each genome has a core and then other stuff that adapts it to, to a niche. At least that's the way I'm going for it. So in this sequencing project, we did seven uh, million base pairs and 52% of that total pathosphere is uh, in the core. And as you get more, it gets, uh, it gets bigger. And this turned out to be a really useful tool for designing the reduced genome. Uh, this is the four sequence genomes. I didn't mention what the fourth one is. It's a meningitis strain. And the uh, colored stuff are things that are in that genome uh, that are not in uh, K12. No, things that are, um, yeah, the baseline is K12. So anything that is homologous to K12 you don't see anything. If it's different, if it's an insertion, you have it. Why don't I get this? Uh, I'll hold it. So if you look at these regions and delete anything that is different in all the strains or absent in all the strains, then you have something that can be removed and you're moving toward the basic core. Uh, you got to help. Oh, you want to help? Yeah. <laughs> I need it. <laughs> so this is kind of the evolutionary principle for reducing a genome to uh, get the... Sorry, you're not being amplified, right? I'm not being amplified. Okay. So let's try it here. And some of these things are really quite structural. In K12, there is an island here which is almost like a prophage. It's called a pathogenicity island if it were in a pathogen. In 0157, there's a completely different sequence that is integrated in the same place uh, that actually codes for some pathogenic function. So the simplest thing to remove are these big pathogenicity islands. This is kind of a histogram showing the range of size of island, islands. They go down to a, uh, this is a log scale. This is 100 bases here. I believe our cutoff was 50 in doing this slide, going up to, uh, I think, 80,000 is the biggest. So there's quite a range of size there. And uh, within these regions that are dispensable in the K islands, there's a lot of transposable elements or recombination hotspot sequences are uh, a kind of probably a former transposable element. A lot of prophages, phage remnants, other cryptic genes a lot of uncharacterized genes. And amazingly, the, these are all things that are analogous to or homologous to known virulence determinants in other organisms. They're, uh, they say E. coli is a, K12 is a pathogen waiting to happen. So getting rid of these gives us an uh, advantage of potential improved safety in drug production, things like that. Uh, this IS hopping is a lot bigger deal than I realized, but um, in the human genome sequence that was published by the uh, U.S. government consortium, there were 18 IS sequences that had hopped into backs that they had sequenced. And if you 
there's a paper that the reference is on the next slide, looking at Gen, GenBank EMBL database. Co Kovarik did this work and found one in a thousand of the eukaryotic sequences in that database have some kind of an IS. So one in a thousand of your plasmids will have an IS in it, I guess, uh, if, if you sequence it. And, and we took some PCR from plasmid preps and there, no matter how well you purify the plasmid prep, there's ISs that you can see. Uh, so it is really impossible to produce a uh, really correct preparation of a plasma DNA in regular E. coli. Uh, this is the counts that Kovarik got for the data from the database. And so we decided that we would set as our goal, focus on removing horizontally transformed DNA, i.e. the K island, retain core genes coding for normal growth on minimal medium, remove the IS sequences, remove potential virulence genes, adherence genes, toxin genes, cryptic operons, and to do it all without leaving any remnants. Because another problem is you don't want to have a process that will be um, leaving behind a lot of duplicate sequences at, or even different sequences at the points where you remove something. Uh, this can make the, the uh, continuation of the process difficult. So this just shows the functions that we chose for elimination. Uh, this is a non law uh, I think this, this is a uh, plan for the order of removal, so we get the biggest bang for the buck, removing things uh, that are big first. And we got to this deletion of MDS-12, multiple deletion strain 12, which we published a couple of years ago, which illustrated the principle and got rid of the 12 biggest uh, islands. And then we spent the next two years working this out finding regions, building primers, developing technology, and we finally got to one that is deleted 40 segments. And the, uh, these are gene chips run on the DNA to confirm it. Interestingly enough, when we got this finished, there were still three IS sequences in it as determined by the chips, which we had to chase down because they had hopped while we were making the, <laughs> making the thing. And there was also mysteriously uh, a phase that we didn't know about called Phi 80 that had hopped into this. And we got a chip that has all the ISs known to man from a database, all the phages, all the drug resistances, all the plasmid origins, and all this stuff. And it's just astonishing when you just look at a strain, even some commercial strains, that they have things in them that nobody has had the ability to look at. So these nimble chips are very nice as a way, it's too bad they're so expensive, but it, it's sort of a way you should it's something you should do after every construction. Uh, so this is all the stuff that's deleted. Uh, the percent here is 14.25, uh, and then we have 41, 42, and 43, which push this up to 15 by just deleting things that we wanted to get rid of, like we wanted them to be T1 resistant, we wanted to get rid of NDA, a few of the standard things that people want to see in a bug. And this MDS-72, which we're on our way to, will have deleted 20. You can see that the efficiency of removal or the quantitative uh, amount goes down if you choose to do the biggest one first. So now we get to the data. This is the doubling times as a series going uh, from the wild type, number 12, number 31, number 41. And the, uh, this is the error uh, bars on the doubling time data. So in minimal medium, it, which is what we kept selecting for, it, the growth rate just stays the same. In a rich medium, the, actually it slows down. It's probably losing some of the uh, catabolite, catabolism things for things in the LB. Uh, when we now measure the uh, hopping, and we have a couple of different methods for measuring it, but one that is nice and traditional is that there is a cryptic operon called BGL which makes E. coli able to grow on salicin. And so one way that you can get salicin, uh, bugs that will grow on salicin, is for one of these ISs to hop into the promoter and then it activates the gene. And th this is the spectrum. Most of the salicin resistant, I mean salicin capable bugs 
have either IS-1 or IS-5, and then there's this other set, which are up promoter mutants, uh, point mutants, basically. Uh, now another, oops, I always go backward. Another way to measure mutation rates uh, is to look for cycloserine resistance, which is a uh, transporter that uh, transports the drug in, and so the mutant that makes it resistant tends almost always to be some type of a knockout of CYCA. So again, in the deletion strain, the uh, part of that knockout response that comes that is owing to the insertions is uh, completely eliminated. The little red thing is very small deletions, and then the, uh, the white or yellow color represents point mutations. Uh, I think it's really interesting, and it didn't exactly surprise me that uh, basically the contribution of IS hopping to spontaneous null mutants is about a third of, of what you get. Uh, then this is a uh, measurement of the basically the mutation rate to point mutations of the deletion strain done seven times a lot of statistics, and this is sort of what the variation is, which reaches the conclusion that basically there is no statistically significant difference or a very slight one uh, in just the mutation rates other than IS hopping in the MDS strains. I forget whether this was 41 or 42, but they're all pretty much the same. Now, when you actually look at gene expression, and I've done a lot of gene expression experiments, and I, I will just summarize them by saying it's really remarkable that not much happens as a result of the deletion program to change gene expression. There's three or four things that happen that there, we think we know the reasons for. But basically, it, it seems like uh, from a system standpoint, it is locally um, homogeneous so that the regulation works even if you cut pieces out of it, sort of like the brain. Uh, and that may be part of the principle of of the evolution of these things, that as these genes are moving around, they have to work in their new environment so the things that are needed to regulate them properly are, are condensed. But this was a very interesting one because I looked at the genes that were expressed when you made high levels of protein off of a plasmid, recombinant protein. And I got, to, got a little suspicious of this because I, I learned early on that heat shock induces the IS transposases. So I wondered if other shocks would do this. And as you can see, that is the case, that the very uh, induced genes include the transposases for IS3, IS5, IS150, integrase of P4, uh, other things that are indicating to me that these stress responses activate the ISs. This is not heat shock, but something else. This is overexpression shock. Oh. Oh. But I was introducing it from the standpoint of heat shock that led me to think stressful conditions would induce these things. And we never did check a lot of different kinds of stresses that we put these bugs through in everyday life, but uh, or in the lab. But what happens, I think it's very beautiful and very logical, is that if there's a lot of protein being expressed, it unleashes sort of a shower of low frequency but very strong knockout. So a cell that has a virus or something uh, that has infected it, if it can by chance hit that gene, it will s protect itself from the invader while at the same time not damaging its genome that greatly as it would if it just started mutating everything. So I really think that these uh, elements have a role that is useful in evolution, but not useful in bioproduction of protein. And in fact, there are a lot of, if you really talk to fermenter people, they often will find that uh, suddenly the, the thing they're trying to produce stops and it has an IS in it. At least I've heard tell of such stories. So then we did an experiment to see whether heat shock or cold shock actually in change the mutation rate. And in fact, although it isn't as dramatic uh, as it, it is the case, that 
if this is the control, heat shock, you double the amount of uh, uh, cycloserine resistant, I forgot to put what this is, cycloserine resistant cells, and cold shock even more so. And uh, point mutations, that isn't what happens. They go down at shock, or maybe no chain. And uh, not much of an effect on these little small deletions. So for what it's worth, the mutation analysis uh, seems to follow this uh, idea. Now, the, and I'm getting near the end. I don't know whether I'm running out of time. Uh, this gentleman, Dr. Kyle, in the animal vaccine development program in Germany saw that MDS-12 paper, and he told me this story, that he could not clone this gene for a uh, viral protein 60 because every time he isolated a um, clone and then sequenced it, it had either IS-1 or IS-5 in it. It was literally so bad that he couldn't get the clone. And so he took MDS-40, uh, and then, of course, there was, I mean, you really have to wonder what was happening if, if there is no copy of the IS in the genome and it hops in. So he managed to get the clone. Everything was fine. So then I suggested, why don't you take the good clone and put it back into E. coli and see what happened. And by God, he did six into DH10B and six into C600, so that's 12, and he got um, seven patterns. In other words, here is um, the clone the way it should be, and then these are all the things that individual just randomly picked colonies produced from this uh, from this IS magnet. And uh, these are the sequencing data that show uh, this is an IS1, IS5, TN10 also in there. Uh, so that is another practical benefit of removing ISs. This uh, is a transformation experiment. It shows that all three of these strains, MDS, the parent MG, and DH10B, uh, have the same magnitude of transformation efficiency uh, with PBR322. It seems that they're actually a little bit better for large DNA. This is a back. And I think one of the things we want to do with this strain is to get it used for back production so that we don't have these hops into the genome uh, databases. Uh, this is a, one we don't need to go into. Okay, so now my last two slides are attempts to see how well this performs as a organism to increase yield or to use for making large amounts of protein. So this is a fermenter that Dr. Harkham did in which uh, we were able to get the OD up to 100 and the uh, dry cell weight in grams per, uh, grams per liter up to 44, which is considered to be pretty good. And this is one of these fed batch uh, deals where you add the glucose as you go. And the, uh, so then we tried growing a similar culture and activated. Um, and we had a plasmid with cat uh, chloramphenicol aminotransferase. Uh, on the lac operon, and these were induced about here with lactose, and then the cat goes up, and it's about the same for all, for the red wild type MG1655 and the two replicates of the blue uh, multiple deletion strain. These are the growth curves, and uh, glucose, once it starts being fed, is effectively zero. And something we found out that I don't understand but that we, it's something we're probably going to have to figure out and fix is that uh, there's this acetate reuptake that takes place. This is the level of acetate as a function of the time in the fermentation. And usually when you run out of oxygen, a little bit of acid, acetate is excreted, and then that gets reuptaken. That all happened. And then the two deletion strains put out a lot of acetate at the end, whereas the control didn't. So there's something happened in the regulation of 
acetate overflow. And so far, we think that we always take these things as opportunities because this is somewhat toxic. And so if we're getting recombinant proteins at a normal level under that situation, if we can figure out how to get it back to normal, it would maybe make more protein. So uh, that is our conclusions. Uh, these strains are so far behaving as we had hoped that the core genome contains the stuff that makes E. coli the bug that we love and all the rest of this junk can be done away with. And I believe on the whole, uh, the size we're going to get down to of perhaps 3,700 genes is by no means small by a lot of standards, nor is it simple, but it does seem like it will work well. So thanks very much for your attention. Yeah. It has the same doubling time, Fred, but um, does it make smaller colonies, or are they the same size? Colonies are the same. Okay. They look pretty, uh, pretty normal. In fact, completely normal. A question over here? Yeah, uh, sort of along those lines. Hi, Fred. Hi. Uh, 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 have you tried to complement this approach with, uh, uh, with a rational design uh, efforts, uh, selecting, I don't know if this would work, but uh, hands up who else hasn't thought of this, right? Uh, lo looking for faster growth, uh, for example. D if you had an E. coli that doubled every 10 minutes, right? for, um, for example, would that be, you know, be fun to find out what that was about? I'll, I'll answer that question in two parts. The first part, is there any attempt to be rational? Uh, what, what we are, one of the things we did rationally was remove the flagella and the chemotaxis. And that gives, frees up energy, and it has an interesting uh, uh, side effect that the cells are easier to spin down. They, they don't try to swim away. Uh, <laughs> as, as, as far as um, evolution in culture, basically, we have not done any cultural evolution ourselves, but we have been working with Bernard Paulson on a strain evolution project in which he started growing them on glycerol, which they grow slowly on, and then speeding it up. And we have uh, also done a couple of deletions in MG1655 that make uh, a system that should, as you evolve it, increase lactate production. And that seems to work. And so we have built the same thing in the MDS strain. So one of the things on our agenda is to see whether the in-culture evolution, both on glycerol and on, on this, uh, in this lactate system growing on glucose, well, whether these things evolve more slowly, evolved on a completely different path, whether they uh, uh, will do exactly the same. So uh, the answer is, not yet. Something back there? Uh, yeah. Do these, um, do the genes that you've deleted, do they tend to have any, can you hear, hear my question or not? I can hear you okay. fine. I just don't know where you are. Oh, <laughs> there. oh there you are. Yeah. Um, so these genes that you've deleted, uh, or these island sequences, do they tend to have any kind of operon bias and operon structure? They tend to be... Operon bias or right. operon structure. Uh, Usually what we have done is to pick a region that has some island or something, and then try to extend out as far as possible until we get to a clear stopping point, and then make it and then see if it works. And so usually operons are always, if, if we can recognize them, we delete the whole operon. And if there's a gene to catabolize some unusual substrate that we're not that interested in, we'll usually delete that with the rest, but we haven't gone directly to remove catabolism genes. Um, but there isn't anything I, I can think of to answer your question uh, about the operons. Can you use the mic, please? Oh, sorry, you don't have it. 
Do the, do the transcripts tend to be polycystronic or not? I mean, those genes that you're deleting. Actually, there's a, uh, this polycystronic business is a little over-exaggerated. Most of the genes of E. coli actually are just singletons, but the flagella was a real big operon, and I don't think there was anything particular, s systematic or, or anything. Uh, I, I never really looked at it with an eye toward answering your question. But there's nothing that stood out over there. You are shooting for an organism that is, you said, 3,700 genes or so, and that's still a far cry from what they have with mesoplasma. So what are you leaving in that they don't have? I mentioned those at the very beginning, things for anaerobic, a whole load of re re regulators. Um, it's a me metabolic generalist. It has two or three different ways to do recombination. So there's a whole lot of redundancy there, which is no reason to get rid of unless you're just going to have a philosophy about it. If it works, <laughs> if it works, I don't know. Go ahead. And it's a, I didn't mean to say that I would not go below the 3,900 or 3,700. The 3,700 is what evolution is telling us nature has selected to be a, a good E. coli. Um, now, we could start to strip it further. Um, in, terms of, in terms of the folding of um, foreign proteins in these strains, like, right. say, higher eukaryotic proteins, do you see any differences at all? And I guess the, one of the reasons I'm asking is, are the chaperones all ma maintained in, in, in these strains? Are you taking some of them out or, or what? We're leaving them in unless we remove them by accident, all of them. And a lot of people add more for these types of strains. So I think they're very important, uh, but we haven't had any... We haven't done any experiments to measure them. Measure, I mean, function. I think they, there's probably some chaperones that are good for one kind of protein, some good for another. Maybe there's chaperones that are specifically good for folding, refolding, heat shocked um, proteins. Maybe some of them function right at the time it's being synthesized. Okay, we have a question down here. I can just shout a question. Uh, you mentioned the necroporation novel are better than wild duck. If it's better, can you explain why? I certainly can't. I have no idea why. Can and you repeat the question, actually? Oh, the question was, why is the electroporation better, or if it is? And I, this is a little bit of a variable property. When you do a bunch of uh, electroporation prep, sometimes they work and sometimes they don't. So I don't want to make a big deal of this, but you can certainly make as good an electroporation prep with this bug as you can with anything else, and by tightening up on the, the uh, you know, being sure it's all done very reproducibly, we're sort of homing in on a very good, on a very good protocol, but I don't know why electroporation works in the first place. But would, wait, could you imply there's some change in physical characteristics? Huh? Could you imply that is there some change in some physical characteristics that's why it's better? Well, one of the things that obviously helps is the NDA mutation, which is a, something that knocks out the, uh, a nuclease. There, this whole DOR thing that is in the literature about DH10B, there's a flaw in that because the entire 20,000 base pairs of DH10B around DOR is wild type. So there is no DOR mutation. But I sort of chased that for a while to see if that could help. And that's the only thing anybody's really said helps. So it's a mystery completely. The conventional answer is wrong, and there is no other answer. Okay, why don't we thank our speaker one more time? Sorry, I was uh, a little And we'll now <laughs> recess for a short. So there are a variety of natural systems, natural biological systems that perform some sort of computing function. And of course, we know from early work on DNA computing and work on protein interaction, protein computing, and <coughs> also um, what I'll focus on for this talk is uh, cell-based computing, since that seems to be a, a, a unifying topic in this conference. But certainly, the, comp the principles of computing in nature go much beyond this. They extend to whole organisms, into inter organismal interactions, and to whole communities as well. Different kinds of essentially, and with computing, I mean an alg alg algorithmic process that. Re it's a recurrent algorithmic process that has very little, essentially, outside influence. Uh, um, and so, um, 
of course, we've been um, applying um, <coughs> and we've been engineering biological systems for the production of better biologicals, pharmaceutical proteins, natural products, for example, various kinds of metabolites, uh, uh, for about 25, uh, for a number of years, and engineering these systems for, for better and better production and, and better and better compounds. And so now we're proposing to uh, apply similar technology to engineering for information, uh, computing applications, for materials, new materials applications, and maybe energy applications. And so, um, and this, it's these non-biological applications uh, that seem to be the, the, the focus, essentially, of the, or at least one focus of synthetic biology, this engineering focus. And so, it seems natural to ask, what can we learn from this effort, essentially, over the last, this engineering focus over the last 30 years or so, that, that is, is relevant uh, for this area? Thank you. And so, well, I'm very pleased to see this direction developing because the uh, sort of the non-bio the non -bio nanotechnology direction that has been discussed uh, quite widely uh, for many years now, um, for biologists has some, is, is not very satisfying. Uh, essentially, it feels much more, for biologists at least, it seems much more logical uh, since everything in biology is, is, is essentially uh, 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 defined at the level of nanotechnology, and is, is, def is molecularly defined. Um, we feel biology is a very uh, important uh, part of nanotechnology in principle, or, or example for nanotechnology to follow and to copy. And so uh, we'd much rather build on the f four billion years of existing design that biology can provide us. And so we'd like to uh, look at existing biological circuits and use these uh, 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 as a starting point and also look at the, uh, I think maybe one thing that is, um, didn't come up as much as, uh, this morning, but I think it's a very important topic of discussion, um, is, uh, is it's actually not, uh, not just taking the same old rational design process forward and putting it, applying it to biological systems, but I think we should look at the, uh, the existing evolutionary processes of biology and thinking what these processes can, of, of biology can do for engineering and how, how that can be applied. <coughs> Since, since these processes have led to exquisite uh, complexity, uh, beyond that, uh, essentially, what can be what can be man, what has been possible to be man-made by rational design. Um, now, there's also some disadvantages uh, that that appear to be uh, present with the biological um, with the biological approach, and so I, I would predict that rational design of a similar f uh, 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 a similar complexity in terms of circuit board uh, layout. Uh, um, is going to be more difficult with bi biological systems because the number of interactions, the number of floating pieces, the number of, uh, of um, moving parts that are interacting is so much greater. And so the, um, the specificity, by not being spatially limited, um, the spe specificity has to be much greater. And that's going to be a tremendous design challenge going forward. Um, and so because of this, this, uh, in, this these in increased number of interactions, um, the design challenge increases, and, and the question is whether this requires a fundamental change in the design process. <clears throat> and so when we look at the um, sort of the main premise of what people are describing, the, the taking this parts list and building, uh, um, um, essentially designing a genetic circuit, by rational design in silico first, and then getting parts uh, from this shared parts inventory, which is a wonderful concept, um, and then building these cir circuits actually in a cell, testing their performance and fixing the problems essentially one by one. Um, this is of course something that biologists have been doing for biological applications for 30 or so years, uh, uh, ever since recombinant DNA has been invented. And um, so we have a good feeling for what, what kind of things go wrong when you do this, what, what works and how often it works and what, that, what goes wrong. And so the, um, these parts that are described as having well-defined performance um, um, this is, a, of course, this is very difficult to do because it really depends on the context of all of the other uh, thousands of genes in the cell. And so you, you can never really, uh, very, uh, in terms of quality control, it's very hard to, to actually guarantee that these work in the, in the environment because the environment is so complex and also going to be changing from, uh, uh, and with, so, so this is very hard to, uh, um, to guarantee, much harder than with the tra traditional um, hardware. Uh, <coughs> And so, um, because everything interacts um, in solution, um, the specificity quickly becomes limiting. And so you can look at a natural system and you see everything working just fine. But it's uh, hard to appreciate that this, this took billions of years uh, to come to fruition and, and to essentially be, to, be, to, to, for all the problems to work out 
to, to work themselves out so that everything can interact without uh, 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 causing problems. This is a tremendous design challenge and a tremendous amount of information content involved in, in avoiding those, in, those interactions. And so um, when you start changing things or putting random proteins into cells, um, you have to be prepared for large numbers of, of, of interactions that, are not, that were not anticipated. And the question is, do you have time to essentially sort all of these out one by one? Are you going to take single components and sort out each problem one by one? Um, and from experience, we know when, when you've evolved an enzyme by directed evolution to have a much greater potency, when we try to interpret it, we have like 10, 12 mutations. We can't even interpret these single mutations, So, to, uh, even going backwards. So to predict uh, um, ahead of time, or to analyze essentially what is wrong with your proteins, why it doesn't work, is a tremendous amount of work. Um, and so it's very important to, at the, at, the, at the outset, to design the strategy such that you avoid, that you essentially have enough numbers that's typically how we solve it, that you have enough numbers, essentially enough different variations are being tried in a systematic fashion to blow through those problems and to, that you have a selection for the ones that actually work. So you don't have to go in and, uh, and try to understand these problems because these, are problems, these problems are typically not very interesting. They're just unpredicted reactivities, something binds something else for un unpredicted reasons, but it's not, it's not interesting to solve. It's not something that, you, because it's, all of these are interactions pretty much are, as a class are known and um, it's not something you want to spend your time on. And so, <clears throat> in a sense, this becomes the, the number of interactions, the number of things that can go wrong at a, at a larger scale, uh, quickly, quickly become beyond rational analysis. And so, <clears throat> now in biology, this has been, so in, in terms of biology, natural biology has solved this problem, has found a way to design cells where the pieces all work together and don't kill the cell. And the question is, um, how can we, how does this work, and how can we make this work in the future for complex uh, uh, circuits? And so, <clears throat> uh, I'm sure, uh, so, uh, it's, uh, biological evolution is effectively the only process that has given rise to very, uh, uh, to, to extreme complexity. And so there's, uh, there, we, and we have not been able, been able to implement this process in, in, fun, in other ways yet, like in, for example, with genetic algorithms. It ha we haven't been able to have the same sort of complexity by mimicking, mimicking this process yet. And this is, of course, a major goal that we'd like to achieve. But in, at first, I think we have to understand this process better. And I think this topic, this synthetic biology topic and this genetic circuitry topic is a perfect uh, opportunity to understand the process of biological evolution better, to apply it to engineering rather than to biological compounds, and hopefully the biological, the evolutionary logic will, will uh, itself translate to engineering and will be, uh, be applied to also to non-biological systems. And so, <clears throat> um, <clears throat> if I were to start this, I would start essentially from the, um, the billions of complex functioning computers that already exist. Uh, use these as functional starting points. And then evolve these gradually toward design, design desired functions. And <clears throat> so, uh, um, I would use uh, 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 as much as possible existing genomes, but also sets of existing parts that are, have been shown to work together well, and if necessary, individual parts. But as you go smaller and smaller, the risk increases for, for, for trouble. And so it's, um, it's important to be as conservative as possible, to keep, keep the organism functioning as, as much as possible without uh, increasing the risk of knocking it out. And so it's important to avoid, in fact, de novo construction as much as possible, if not necessary, there's no reason to take this risk. Um, and so <clears throat> the way I would go about this is to um, mimic the natural evolutionary process and also what the, uh, the process of breeding uh, by creating large numbers of complex combinations uh, using uh, conservative combinations, so complex combinations of conservative modifications. And this is effectively what how in biology these changes are made and how you go from one generation of functional individuals to another generation of functional individuals that actually have thousands of modifications. But because all, each of these modifications is relatively conservative in function, they can be, you can create complex combinations of them and find a gradual path of improvement. And so <clears throat> um, we would, uh, I would apply recombination of closely related genomes using natural diversity of, of organisms and then uh, um, recombining uh, either the whole genome or the pa or just specific pathways or specific genes. Uh, so it's important is to decide what, at what level do you want to reprogram these organisms, um, to which extent, and this of course depends on rational information. And so one would typically use different tools to operate at different levels. Uh, one would essentially rationally target a certain uh, number of genes 
um, but then um, and rationally design the libraries for the kinds of uh, changes that you want to make. But in the end, because the interactions are not uh, pr uh, uh, sufficiently predictable, you'd, you'd actually implement them with libraries. So libraries of 10 to the 6 or so different, different, different variants of each part, for example. And then after each step, select the, the parts that work best. Um, so a variety of other approaches that one could use. Um, it's also it's very, a very conservative approach is to knock genes out rather than knock, rather than knock things in and bring new genes into a cell, which is um, less conservative you, because you require, uh, require this new protein now to work, to be expressed and to be folded properly. Um, to, knock, to knock something out is very, is very simple, to knock a single gene out. And you can make very complex combinations of knockouts that are in, in or partial knockouts also, that are still quite, quite uh, conservative. And so you can create uh, very complex combinations of conservative effects that together get you to the phenotype very efficiently. And one way of doing this in a targeted fashion, where you only target those genes that you want to, to manipulate, is using, for example, inhibitory RNA or also antisense RNA. In other cases, you may want to create redundancy of genes so that you can evolve some uh, for new functions, whereas leaving the other ones for housekeeping functions, you don't, you don't uh, sort of, they don't, are not affected. Um, <clears throat> so the typical approach that we have been applying this as a company, also commercially, uh, to, um, um, uh, to commercial projects, um, for mostly for industrial microorganisms, is to take a population, and this is essentially mimicking the natural, uh, how um, natural evolution works, and also how uh, animal and plant breeding works, is to take a population of these existing uh, uh, biological systems that have uh, similar functions, similar sequences, similar functions. So typically closely related species. And the population diversity for each of these species contains up to uh, or around 10 to the 6 variants or so of, e of each of the different parts. Um, and the, the, this, this diversity is the single, nucle are the single nucleotide polymorphisms that exist within this species. And so <coughs> by taking a collection of diversity from diversity of natural or organisms and then homologously recombining these. Now there's a choice here at which level do you recombine these? Single gene, pathway, chromosome, whole genome. Um, <coughs> and then screening for the improvements towards desired function and, doing, uh, and, and eliminating the least functional reco uh, uh, combinations and replicating the best uh, um, um, combinations and repeating this process for many cycles. Um, you're still, uh, this process uh, this evolutionary process applied to microorganisms um, um, is still only samples a very small fraction of all of the potential combinations that could be created. Um, but over time, what's happening here is that the, the bad parts, the parts that are incompatible with other parts, uh, are being eliminated. And the good combinations of parts are essentially, uh, are, uh, tend to migrate together. For example, would be co-localized on plasmids or on integrons. And so this is a strategy that uh, you see widely happening in nature where pieces that, that, co that, co that work together uh, travel together. And so they are essentially, they, they're, they're, they tend to co-migrate and not be linked. They occasionally are linked by a crossover event, event but at a, at a very low rate. They tend to travel together because they work well together. And so <coughs> the good combinations essentially become closely linked into sets that, that work well and that these are sets of parts is the way you would uh, want to design them. Um, and we see many natural strategies for creating those those sets, and uh, uh, so integrons, for example, you see combinations of, of um, uh, resistance markers that are combined into a set and that travel together, uh, and also conjugative plasmids similarly. And so importantly, um, we have been running this as a company now for about 10 years, uh, and there are many, uh, many valuable applications of this process, um, and so this technology uh, can, and also in the future, can be further developed without any government funding, which I feel is over, over, overall is a very, very positive way to go. And so, <laughs> so, okay, good question. But that's a fraction of the total that's, uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> that's a fraction of the total that was spent on, on the, uh, um, um, <laughs> but so, but, but so also in the future, I see these, these kinds of engine, in the future, um, new technologies along these same lines. Uh, um, for these different levels of recombination and also these different uh, um, commercial applications, there's a clear path forward um, to essentially uh, build further layers of technology and scope this out much further. And it's a essentially economically neutral path can be created, um, which I think is a very important characteristic for choosing a project. Um, and so, <clears throat> 
couple trends at this. Uh, there's a couple opposing trends at this conference, I think, and, and this is very interesting, actually. Um, we see that natural systems having been essentially developed and uh, evolved over four billion years, and uh, um, in contrast, we have systems that were rationally designed by men, uh, complex metabolic systems, and we have uh, a much shorter experience at designing these. And so the question is, um, what are the building blocks that we're going to use, and what is the design pro process we're going to use? And so we can use biological building blocks in a rational design process, and that uh, appears to be a, st a strong trend at this conference. But we can also use, um, uh, and, and I hope in the future, um, um, essentially man-made building blocks and an evolutionary design process. Or we can use an evolutionary components, uh, biological components, and an evolutionary design process for, for non-biological applications. So there's a variety of ways to combine this. And um, the trend, for example, a small genome might, might have advantages for a rational approach, but a large genome, I would argue, will have advantages for, for a evolutionary approach. Um, <clears throat> and so, when we look at the process of, direct of natural and directed evolution, and we look at this as a process of computation, in that it's an algorithmic process, process that is recursive and requires no intervention by man, uh, that runs naturally, um, it's a process of diversity generation and selecting of the fittest. Uh, <clears throat> now, if we compare this to the process by which um, previous speakers this morning were proposing to generate biological circuits, um, it's, it's, it's rather different, and so it's interesting to compare these two processes. If, if, you, if you want to build a rather simple circuit uh, in, a, in, a, in an organism, <coughs> in E. coli, for example, um, you just have a, a, a few parts, uh, you expect rather few problems. We know that from engineering organisms for uh, lack operators and, and, and different promoters, et cetera, and, and different, exp uh, different express genes, a, a number of, you can put a number of components in without having uh, major problems. But we also know that, that, from, uh, that when you make things more complex, and, and start, things start to interact not so much with themselves, but they start to interact with other parts of the cell in, in unknown ways. The mRNAs interact, or all sorts of possible interactions that you w w could never have been predicted. And I would, I would, I would argue in the future will never be, we are, not, not, are fundamentally not predictable. And so then the approach becomes that you, what, that this is how we typically operate in biology, if, we, uh, if we're engineering these pieces, we, we make a library of something. So we put in the clone in the whole library, 10 to the 6 is a typical number that we transform, and we screen for the one that works, or select for the one that works, and then we make the next element, the next part as a library of 10 to the 6, put it in, select for the one that works with the previous part, et cetera. And so you keep going like this to make little libraries that's a very safe and, and uh, prevents a tremendous number of problems um, by, by, by doing it this way. And so. I would argue, argue that some of the parts you might want to have in library version because then you, it's easy to select uh, the functional ones. Um, now, what become, becomes limiting here is that, uh, for that you have to screen or select each library separately after you introduce it for function and uh, uh, ability to work with the previous one. And you can see that it's impossible to actually put all of these in simultaneously because the numbers become too big. Of course, you can go to smaller numbers and you may still be able to get it work. But to get it to work. But now if you start to make very complex circuits by this approach, this approach will stop working because the combinatorials has become too large. And so, <coughs> um, so that's a, a limitation of the de novo synthesis process that you, that you um, um, need to now combine, uh, 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 start combining proven multi-part modules. So you have sets of modules that have been proven to function together in some system have been tried, and then you combine those piece, pieces together to create larger and larger assemblies. Um, and that's actually similar with DNA synthesis by itself because you need to check each piece separately um, for function sometimes before you start combining larger pieces to make an organism. Uh, and so <coughs> it's also the site reactions uh, may not show uh, until very late in the process because you may be able to check, what, uh, but it's very difficult that they, that they will to ensure that they will work in the final context. And so um, there's a good reason to argue on a theoretical basis that you should have the whole system there, all the components there from the, from the beginning, and then try to make it work better and better. Because that, la that last piece that you add may actually have major problems with the first piece that you added. And so the sequential process has major limitations, theoretical limitations. And so th that's why in biology, I think, well, I'm not sure that's why, but in, at least in biology you see these pieces all being together and gradually evolving in function. 
And so the question is, well, how does biology deal with this issue um, of, of the um, increasing combinatorials? And so <clears throat> the diversity that is used in nature is not random point uh, uh, diversity. It's not random point mutagenesis. It tends to be homologous recombination of pre-existing diversity. And so existing natural sequences that are recombined where each mutation, uh, uh, so to speak, is functional, is already proven to be functional. And you're just creating combinations of these proven mutations. And so whereas creating 100 mutations by this process gives you cancer, uh, creating 100, uh, 100 new combinations of these mutations has almost no effect. And yes, the origin of these mutations in biology is in as random point mutations but they may have occurred 10,000 years ago, and essentially because, and because they were functional, they, and, and they, were, they have sim simply stayed in the population, and in fact provided important biological functions in many cases, such as protection against, against viruses. Um, <clears throat> and so I would like to uh, look at an example uh, in, of uh, uh, dog breeding. Just look at an extreme example of how biology really works, and, and why biology is able to uh, develop such very complex systems. And, um, and so I, I, as an argument for why this type of engineering is very interesting and we should look at engineering complex biological circuits uh, for engineering applications, maybe by this approach. Um, and so we know that we can breed dogs that are uh, phenotypically quite different. Uh, um, um, even at 99.9% uh, .9 homology, which is typical, there, the, these, these, uh, the dogs that you're breeding will differ by millions of mutations. Um, and so in the process of meiosis, you're creating hundreds of crossovers in random uh, but uh, homologous locations. The puppies that result uh, are typically diverse, but also highly func fully functional. And so you know that you can go, you can create a wide variety of phenotypes. You can go anywhere in dog space, so to say, with five litters of five cycles of 10 puppies. So very little screening, essentially, and uh, uh, gives you high f very high functionality and allows you to modify phenotype in, in rather dramatic ways. Very different behaviors, uh, very complex properties that are very far uh, removed from the, uh, the genetic basis that you have been able to develop. For example, a sheep, uh, a sheep herding or, uh, by a collie, we've been able to, you can, you can breed that, you can modulate it, and uh, it's, 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 it's technically easy, and yet you're modifying something that is very far removed from the genetic basis. So I feel this is a very, um, nice example of the kind of engineering that, is, that we can do in biological systems is the kind of thing we'd like to be able to apply to all sorts of properties, to all, all sorts of uh, uh, different objects. And this very complex, molecularly very complex process can be directed by a child. And as molecular biologists, we don't have tools that can uh, do anywhere anything near this complexity. And this is where we would like to go. So it's just, I'm, I just want to point out that the, the, the tremendous complexity of the molecular basis of this, uh, permutating hundreds of thousands of mutations um, is an achievable goal. It's not uh, overly error prone. It's, it's, not, uh, it's a, uh, a very uh, gentle method to um, manipulate very complex phenotypes that you could not possibly dream of, uh, of, um, um, mimic, of uh, simulating in, in silico. <coughs> and so if you contrast this, if the approach that, that, that was most widely used and still is widely used, um, of random point mutagenesis, where you take a single B gene, a 1KB gene, and you mutate now, uh, introduce a single random amino acid point mutation at, at, a, at a time. Uh, over many papers have shown that you get, on average, you get about a ratio of 0.1% of improved mutants. So you have to screen thousands of different versions, and you then typically people use the single best clone to parent the next cycle. And so per, per cycle of doing this, you add one useful mutation. So if you want to ad adapt your, your, your parts, for function in the organism by this process. This is, this is a very laborious way to go. You're much better off taking parts from related organisms that are, that are functional in those organisms, recombining those and screening a very small number. And I would, a number probably is like, um, is, is uh, um, orders of magnitude lower than by this process. Um, <clears throat> and so if you compare this uh, uh, error-prone PCR process to uh, breeding, in breeding, uh, by natural recombination of natural diversity, you can manipulate a million-fold longer sequence uh, containing a million-fold more mutations, and yet the frequency of improved clones is much higher. And so um, we feel that the explanation for this is that we're using natural mutations that are proven, and uh, proven in their context and conservative, and that we are per permutating these using homologous recombination. And so we focused on um, 
uh, building this into a process, into a commercial process for optimizing genes and pathways and also whole organisms. And uh, that's now been running for about uh, um, close to eight, eight or so year, eight or eight or so years. Um, <coughs> And this is a very practical process that we use on a day-to-day -day basis to improve uh, genes, pathways, and genomes. And so we're able, we, we can reduce the cycle time dramatically, and we can breed across species barriers, and we can start with whatever number of parents we need, and um, we can express these in whatever organism we want to apply for the screening. And so this is the process that if you have to optimize parts or build libraries of parts, it's very useful to have multiple family members available in case some of the, fam or the, the family member that you want to work is not working, you simply recombine the parts uh, that, are, that are in the library, in the parts list, to generate parts that do work. Um, and whatever the length is, uh, this, this would be the, the, the process that you'd use. <coughs> and so the way this works, you take the, the parts, related, uh, parts that have related sequences, different, different operators, different genes, different promoters, uh, that are closely related, say 80, 80, 90 percent or so. And you recombine these by homologous recombination or, or also, uh, you can also do block-based recombination. Um, and then you screen uh, for the ability of this part to function in the context of the others of the circuit. And so <coughs> then, <coughs> if necessary, the best parts can then be taken and uh, you uh, then shuffled again. The pool, a pool of the best parts is taken and shuffled again for another cycle until the performance is optimal. So you can use, also, if, if, even if your part works in your, in your system, you may want to optimize and fine tune the, or, or increase the, the function of this part in the context of the whole circuit. And that's something, of course, that's not, cap not uh, as easily capable with current, uh, with current hardware. Uh, that is a biological property that you can, with, within the system, you can fine tune this part for op optimum compatibility with the, with, the, with the rest of the system by this approach. And so it's important to, the outcome essentially of this experiment mathematically is independent of the length of the DNA. This, the, these same mutations with the same conservative, uh, more or less conservative nature can be spread out, spread out over a whole genome or over a single gene. Mathematically that has no impact, uh, this, 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 uh, this separation has no impact. It's just how many mutations are there and how conservative are they. <coughs> and so when you make a library of random point mutants, from this uh, single part. Um, um, and so you do error prone PCR to generate on average one to three amino acid mutations of this part. Um, if you do higher level mutagenesis, uh, the parts tend to be, if you introduce more mutations than this, the parts tend to be uh, in, um, inactive. That has been shown over and over in many systems. Um, so you're sampling only a very small part of sequence space right around this, your starting sequence. In contrast, if you take four parts that were uh, that are that are from closely related organisms, that are, for example, 80% homologous, and you shuffle these, and you create a sparse library, in which the neighboring mutants differ by multiple mutations because of the block exchange uh, between the the the, uh, the the starting sequences. Now you've created a sparse library, and if you screen this library, you'll you, and then focus on the best mutants, then you can recombine these for further cycles to get more higher density sampling between these, and so you can continue to evolve your part for better and better function in the context of the whole circuit. And so there's a variety of ways that you can uh, make these libraries. So there's, there's rational elements to these libraries that you can dial in block-based functions, essentially. Uh, you, can, you can do a lot of rational design, include also previously known mutants to stack the odds in your favor. And this is where it becomes a, a, essentially a mixture of rational design and uh, um, a, a library approach. And so in some cases, you may not have natural diversity. And then you can you can you can add error prone PCR, or you can add partial genes that are inactive. Uh, um, you can add uh, rational mutations that have been published, for example. You can, if uh, a lot of mutations are bunched up together, you can uh, unlink them by directed crossovers using all the nucleotides that are spiked in. Um, if you want to insert elements, for example, num different numbers of repeats of an oligo of a, of a an op operator of, or a promoter, uh, you can spike these in at any uh, place that you want. Uh, using, uh, using essentially um, synth synthetic elements that are just uh, will insert themselves there by in the, P in the overlap PCR process. And <coughs> you can also spike in exons or introns. You can do com uh, computational linking or unlinking using partial least squares optimization. And a lot of this, of course, is implemented using synthetic genes so that you can use codon optimization and codon libraries to adapt these elements to the optimum codon usage for the organism that you're going into. And in some cases also, we can, you, can, you can essentially start these 
uh, libraries with different compositions of the parts. So you have two different parts that you recombine in one experiment, three other parts that you re recombine. So you have different combinations of starting points of parts that will give you a different outcome and uh, allow you to go faster towards the uh, desired outcome, towards optimization of the, of the parts in, uh, in the context of the whole circuit. So the variety of strategies from classical breeding, in fact, that are well known uh, that you can apply to improving these parts. Um, but we're not only interested in, in improving parts themselves. Uh, um, a, a major challenge will be to make the parts work together and uh, to um, shuffle these, to, to uh, engineer these genomes at multiple different levels. And so you'll want to do engineering of these circuits, these complex circuits, at the level of individual bases or individual amino acids. Um, you'll want to engineer them at the level of uh, protein axons or introns or at the level of protein domains. You want to engineer them at the level of single genes or single proteins. You'll want to engineer them at the level of pathways or protein complexes. And you want, you'll want to engineer them with, at the level of chromosomes or organelles and at the level of genome, uh, 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 of the whole genome or whole cell. But also you can go beyond that. You can engineer these at the level of the co microbial community. Uh, and so to optimize the genetic and metabolic exchange that occurs. And I'll, I'll say more about that later. But so you, want to have, you really need to have tools. Well, so the logic is very similar for these different levels, uh, homologous and non-homologous re recombination, mostly the, the native mechanisms. You really would like to turn on and off each of these level, levels separately to achieve the outcome that you want. And so we'll have to have tools for this. So we focused on developing separate techniques that uh, uh, allow us to choose a target size where there's specific single genes, specific pathways, or whole genomes. And whether we use as a tool, um, as a modification tool, whether we use point mutation, or homologous recombination, or non-homologous recombination. So we've been working on creating various uh, combinations of these, of these, rec of these uh, goals, uh, uh, tools that allow us to address specific uh, um, uh, technologies. And so, uh, we've been talking about increasing genome size, uh, de decreasing genome size, and, and maybe I've mentioned briefly in potentially increasing genome size. One possibility uh, that I just want to uh, throw out is the possibility for creating a specialized engineering system. This sort of builds on the idea of the specialized ribosome system um, that was published by Huey and de Boer. And <coughs> they published that you can make a specialized ribosome with a specialized mRNA, uh, uh, um, that, that, that where the ribosome binding site is modified. So now this cell uh, has ribosomes that only make express one type of, R of, R of RNA, which is your overexpressed protein. <laughs> And so you can extend on this. You can actually have a housekeeping genome, for example, Bacillus subtilis, uh, that is completely separated from an engineering genome, for example, E. coli. So you want these pieces to not interact at all, so that you have a housekeeping part that you can turn on and off at will, and you can de de degrade or denature these host proteins if you, if you want, and you want to have a, a genome uh, that is optimi optimized for engineering and has, does not have to perform any housekeeping uh, uh, um, um, duties. And so this, this genome, you want to have a separate ribosome binding site and separate 16S RNA so that its ribosomes only recognize uh, uh, its, its mRNAs. And so these would be ribosomes that only function for this part. And now you can, these ribosomes don't have any housekeeping duties. They can sp you can feed them all kinds of different tRNAs loaded, so loaded up with all kinds of amino acids. There, there are no, no uh, restrictions anymore on, on having to do housekeeping duties. And um, so you can now have a lot more freedom to build whatever you want without interfering with this process. Um, that's, yes, correct. Yeah. Yes, yes. Okay, I'll skip through this. Um, <coughs> and so, um, <laughs> essentially, for each application, you'll have to look at what, what sort of, uh, at what level you want to uh, engineer. But do you want to level, engineer at the level of single gene, contiguous pathways, non contiguous pathways? microbial genomes, eukaryotic genomes, or microbial communities. And I'll, um, so there are a number of ways that you can focus on specific distributed pathways. So specific, in, 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 in language of this conference, specific, uh, um, um, <coughs> specific targets that you want to modify uh, for, for function in the circuit, specific parts that you want to modify. Uh, uh, so you want to make a library in several parts to make sure that they work together better than before. And so there's, ways that you can target genes homologously to those specific areas using homologous recombination in yeast uh, to make libraries in each position simultaneously. And then, so you create 10 to the 9 or so different combinations 
and select for the combination that works best and transplant this into your, into your organism of, of choice. The same thing can be done at the uh, inhibitory RNA level. Um, the other, I'll skip through this a little bit. Um, we have been uh, doing a lot of work also at the whole genome level where we try to shuffle whole genomes without any sequence information. This works beautifully. And so without with, uh, very little work, we can recombine these uh, without any knowledge of the sequence. Um, and so in this example, it was published in Nature a couple of years ago. We were able to improve a, a strain that Lily provided us. And Lily had over 20 years, they had evolved it to a, a level that was six-fold higher in, in the production of an antibiotic. And <clears throat> in less than a year, with a much smaller number of assays, we were able to obtain a similar or even better result um, using, using no sequence information just by uh, recombining and selecting, recombining and selecting for just three cycles, whereas Lily had used 20 cycles. Um, I'll skip this one. Um, okay, last one that I really want to focus on. Well, <coughs> we've been focusing, focusing on, on, well, um, on um, learning uh, design rules by simplifying biological systems. Um, and yet in nature you see organisms ev uh, getting more and more complex. And why are organisms getting more and more complex? Well, partially because this increased complexity provides more ways to compete and survive. So if we want to do engineering with these, or with these organisms, what organism do we start with? Do you start with a simple organism or a complex organism to, to, uh, to, uh, as a starting point? And if you're using evolution, I would argue that a complex organism actually is a better starting point. You have more different ways to create the outcome that you want. If you want to create a new metabolic pathway, you're unlikely to create it from a simple organism. You much have a much, have a much better chance uh, by doing this from a complex organism. And so the most complex starting point that we can find is a microbial community. And so I would, I, um, let me skip this. This just shows that having additional tools in E. coli, if you want to make E. coli grow on toluene, getting a, a natural diversity and uh, uh, plasmids and, microbial, and more natural diversity from a microbial community increases the number of ways that you can uh, that you could achieve success in this, in this, uh, 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 with this goal. Okay, well, I'm, <laughs> I'm going to cut you off so that we can open it up to questions. I okay. apologize. That's fine. Um, uh, I'm sorry. Um, sorry. Before I open it up to questions, though, can I, oh, can we clap? <laughs> Um, I'd also like to ask the people in the aisles to please move in. Um, unfortunately, it's against fire codes to have you guys sitting in the aisles. So if you could please move, make your way inside. Um, and so are there any questions? I have a question back there. Yeah, I thought that was very interesting, your combined genome approach, where you had the housekeeping genome and the uh, engineering genome inside the same cell, cell but separated functionally. Um, have you Try to be. Have you tried to um, create something like that with the last concept you mentioned? We have two genomes: one rapidly evol a small one, rapidly evolvable, say, and then a main one to maintain the cell in the in the meantime. So, basically, let one genome do all of the work, and the other one you can maximize your your rate of change and see how far you can go. Um, we we haven't, and 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 on for. Um, the reason is that uh, I think you can get much of the same effect by by just evolving one genome, and so if certain genes. Uh, you want to evolve and have one copy for householding as housekeeping function and the other you want to ev evolve for some special duty, some new special purpose. It's quite easy. The, the organism is smart enough to just duplicate this gene essentially and, and uh, uh, um, do that itself essentially. You don't have to specifically uh, introduce that uh, rationally. And so uh, you, you, this, can, uh, this is a, a, a solution that the, the organism can find itself quite, quite easily. Yes, correct. I think I, I think that's correct. When, when you and so I'm, I'm essentially uh, this is a uh, something that we, we, we're unlikely to pursue ourselves because we're focused mostly on on applying this for commercial projects. Yeah. Uh, we had a question here. So, as uh, someone who does rational design, I just want to offer up a defense um, uh, for, <laughs> for uh, the disdain that you express for it. Um, so, one thing you pointed out was that you know you said the child can mate the dogs and create all this diversity, but and a few slides later, you showed, you said, you know, like to learn about, you had a big cross mark over the, you know, learn about biology from simple systems. And then you went on to talk about, you know, wanting to develop new pathways and whatnot about, you know, getting to something that you want. 
but I think there are sort of two different philosophies here. Like I think the rational approach is probably much more useful in terms of the, the, uh, the means uh, justify the end, whereas I think this sort of the black box approach at U.S. policy may be more useful for the ends justify the means. So, um, no, I, I completely agree, and I think the, the, the ideal really is to choose to be able to choose from the tools of each from each toolbox as as, as the project requires. But, and but so it's I, just simply to complement each should complement the other. I right, but I but I, I guess I'm taking uh, objection to the statement that you can learn best from studying more complex organisms, and I'm saying that no, I, I I'm, and I, I and I'm saying that I, I agree with the previous speakers in that you know going to the simpler organism, you might not be able to do as many things, but I think you'll be able to learn more because it is simpler. I think you'd learn different things from different approaches. And, and so far, in engineering, essentially, the ability to learn from evolutionary systems has not, has not been there. And I think now, essentially, that is the, the, what I, li what I uh, really like about synthetic biology. What I, the, f the fundamental uh, value I see from synthetic biology is that now engineers are really using biology, and they find out the, the good and the bad, essentially, and I think the good will be that, uh, bio, that, that it'll discover evolutionary engin engineering as a very powerful way to, com to manipulate complex systems. And that this will, will complement the existing, uh, uh, the dominating rational design approach. And I think this complement will be very powerful in the future. Uh, we have another question back there. Uh, uh, so let's say I try to construct a new car by taking a Mercedes and BMW, and I make a totally new car. The reason the new car will work. The reason the new car will work is because there's a certain structure about how a car is built that if it's common enough in both of them, it will also make the new car work. Correct. The danger, of course, is that if there's something radically different in in, in something in the nature of the design then if you're a sensible engineer, you make some things recessive so that they don't screw you up yes. and some things are dominant. So do you have any insight on the molecular basis or yes. on some design basis on how you'd make something recessive or dominant or how you well, keep the, the, the structure of something? This is a very nice example. The, and, and sorry, if one car is metric and the other is, uh, uh, is, uh, is non-metric, then it's, it's, uh, you have a problem. And, yeah, and so this is the... Um, <coughs> Uh, and so, <coughs> um, but so organisms have exchanged parts and essentially evolved, co-evolved uh, for billions of years. And so they have evolved their sophisticated structures, integrons and, and uh, conjugative plasmids that have worked out essentially that, that are, so the, the, the community relations in these microbial communities or in genetic exchange and metabolic exchange are finally evolved and you can build on that. And so um, it, it's, it's very similar to, I think I would think that in the, to a human community where if you want to make it do something different, you don't start from scratch, but you use what's there, and you just, you, there's with for, 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 for rather, rather limited so changes, you can make it do something different. It's more specific. Do you have can you use the mic, please? If you the question's a very specific question. Do you have any insight on what makes a certain gene recessive or dominant when you do this? No, but this is easily, uh, from an uh, evolutionary perspective, if you have a clear question, it's, it's a, 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 a relatively s a straightforward operation. Uh, and, and, uh, so. Um, yeah, but I wanted I wanted to think about it from rational design. When you do Correct. mate to human beings, well, what you'd like to you'd like to have an approach that's specifically focused, where you essentially you change genes that are, for example, that modulate uh, 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 methylation, for example, uh, um, and and so you'd like to build these in as library elements, so you can you can mod you can work at these levels uh, specifically, so that not just at genetic changes, but also at epigenetic changes. So uh, epigenetics clearly has a lot to offer. I mean, the same human genome can be, uh, can be expressed as 300 different, completely different, uh, 300 different tissues with completely different properties. And so clearly epigenetics can, alone, without any genetic change, can be a very powerful tool for modification. Okay, we're going to take one last question. Okay, Jerry? The question for Mercedes with BMW, you're not going to get a Prius. <laughs> <laughs> if you start with a BMW, what is it? <laughs> Uh, okay, one question. Can we make it short, please? Um, Pim, so you describe being able to go anywhere in dog space in 50 pups, um, but 
which, which is complex phenotypes, um, for the uh, relatively simple phenotype of increasing the production of one antibiotic, you had to screen 25,000 variants, which is comparable to the number of variants that you have to screen for engineering any specific protein function. What needs to happen in order to get down to the 50, which is actually a screenable number in any assay? Yeah, okay. Um, well, seriously, that's, you, see that you did some of this work. Um, you <laughs> um, but so the, the, you know the 25,000 was composed of 22,000 or, or by error prone, by essentially by random mutagenesis and just a few thousand by, by, by uh, recombination. And so if this experiment had been conducted directly with natural diversity, you probably presumably would, would have only had to screen a few thousand. And so that would have been a tremendous step forward. It wasn't, was not possible in this experiment because we only had one strain to start with, but it's, it shows the, the, the principle. And so that is, I think, the, the, uh, uh, the way forward for combining uh, and making these circuits work. You, you really would like to, to build them from existing parts, not just single parts, but essentially families of parts, so that you have a much better chance that you only have to screen 10 or 20 and you have things that work together. Okay, let's thank our speaker one more time. Okay, and we're now going to be shifting gears a bit and talking more towards the technology end of things. And I think something that a lot of us would like would be um, push button DNA synthesis. And we want to build these minimal organisms to be nice to be able to just synthesize their genomes. So John Mulligan will be talking right now about uh, DNA synthesis, genes today, genomes tomorrow.